Okay, before we head in and talk about the week that was, and if you missed it, uh, wow, did you miss a lot. Uh, before we head in, uh, for the applied level subscribers, industrials are done and uh, the video for uh, understanding capital goods which is part of the industrials video is done using both cat and deer because they're good examples of how to think about uh, the product lineup for capital goods and how they position their product uh, depending on whether you're talking about developing or developed economies um, here is uh, an overview uh, for sector studies of what's already done. You can see the section here includes 34 videos, a total of 52 hours, uh, and there are PDF downloads for these PDFs if you've been through the CFA series. You know it's really just what you see on the screen so you don't have to keep hitting pause and taking notes. So let's just uh, review what we have for those who uh, uh, don't know. Under consumer discretionary, uh, a discussion of the sector and a uh, almost a four-hour video of Doc, uh, Dr. Horton. I keep wanting to call it Dr. <laughs> the Dr. Dr. Horton, DHI. Consumer staples, we have materials, understanding mining, and a almost five-hour walkthrough uh, for Freeport. Financials, there is the sector video. I break down agency and how to understand agency, a five-part series on understanding banks. Uh, part one and two is just uh, very general information about the structure of the balance sheet and the, what type of business a bank is in to get done. Uh, we have interest rate risk, asset quality and capital adequacy, <clears throat> uh, ABR, understanding ABR, and a uh, four-hour, well, almost four-hour video on a short defense. Um, using ABR, of course, but you would follow the same process if you were uh, tearing apart a short report uh, for any other uh, company. Real estate, we have the sector and understanding residential REITs, understanding retail office and industrial REITs, and understanding timber REITs. For utilities, uh, the sector video and understanding electric utilities. The top-down um, category, which was its own category before, is now in sector studies. Uh, business, the slowdown phase, the contraction phase of the business cycle. Uh, top down in terms of rates and spreads, how to understand what interest rates and credit spreads are telling us, and top down factor investing if you want to do that. I don't have recovery and expansion in there because you kind of want to be in those in those phases when it happens. But if we're not going to get a contraction soon, I'm going to go ahead and just do uh, recovery and expansion based on uh, historical uh, recoveries and expansions. I'll just use data from that. <clears throat> Energy sector. Um, a discussion of the sector itself and um, uh, a discussion of oil and gas exploration and production, which is one of the industries in the energy sector. Information technology, discussion of the sector and uh, a, a video breaking down the semiconductor value chain. Healthcare, we have the healthcare sector video and understanding the supply chain for pharmaceuticals because it is quite complex. Uh, so one for manufacturers, that's a long one. It's about three hours long. Distributors and PBMs, and in each of these, I uh, use Pfizer uh, for manufacturers. Uh, distributors, we use, I think, two of the largest distributors. And PBMs, uh, I think I use CVS uh, for the PBM. Uh, and industrials will be added uh, either Monday or Tuesday. And with industrials, like I said, I use cat and deer. Where to go from here? Communications is the next one uh, with telecoms. And then after that, I have three in mind that I can get done before I have to uh, do some level three stuff. Um, steel mills, which I think uh, are important to understand uh, that. Um, casinos, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Steel mills, casinos, and uh, solar. So those are the three that I sort of have at the top of my list of what to do next. If you have anything interesting you'd like to see added other than those three, uh, go ahead and put it in the comment section and uh, thumbs up on the ones you like and who knows, you might change my mind. Okay, one last point to make on uh, pricing. If you uh, are buying the applied level, it is 440. We had a price increase uh, December 1st and uh, through November. Quite a few people took advantage of the lower price at 320. Uh, so it is 440 uh, now because uh, you know more content 
is there and more content will be added. If you are buying the applied level uh, with your CFA subscription, uh, that is the plus. So you can see here full access. This is just level one, 369. There's the plus access for 689. You can see down here, it includes the applied level. Uh, the applied level part of that subscription has no expiration. It's the same as just buying the applied level. But you'll note that the difference in price is still just 320. So if you are adding the applied level as part of your CFA uh, journey, uh, it stayed at 320. It didn't increase to 440. But if you're just buying the applied level without any CFA content, then it is uh, at the 440. Uh, so you do have the opportunity, if you're a CFA candidate buying level one, level two, or level three, uh, just add the plus uh, version and you will get the applied level with it. And again, the applied level has no expiration. So after the exam, uh, you um, lose access to the to the level one or the level two or the level three CFA content, but not the applied level content. That uh, continues on. Okay, look at the drop in rates at the long end of the curve here. Uh, the two year, just the capital market rates all the way up to the third year. Uh, at least a full 25 basis point cut in every key rate uh, and a little bit more for good measure. And that's just week over week. And this is new. Look at this uh, red at the very bottom. This is the change from the beginning of the year. The uh, three-year rate started the year at 4.22. It is now at 4.13. It is lower now after rate hikes throughout the year than it was at the beginning of the year the three, the five, and the seven. And then uh, if you look at the 10 to the 30, just a few uh, basis points there, almost unchanged from the beginning of the year. That is a powerful move in one week. I think uh, a little bit too much move in one week, but we'll get to that a little later. Uh, if you remember the last press conference, not the one we just had, but the one previous to that, uh, I said, this is a guy that's done. Uh, he came out there, he was relaxed, he was conversational, he didn't seem tense at all. I said, this is a guy that's done. It's a guy that's done. And uh, for the December press conference, yeah, he's done. Uh, uh, they are in the pause phase. Uh, and in that press conference, uh, he did admit that part of the conversation in the FOMC was about uh, when to cut rates. Now, Williams came out the next day or two days later and poured a little bit of cold water on that saying we didn't discuss that but too late Powell already said you did too late that's already out there uh, so these are some big cuts now look at where the 10-year is 391 under four percent it had peaked out at 498 100 and 107 basis points from October 19th less than two months ago more than 100 basis points. Same with the 20 year, same with the 30 year, from 5.3 down to 4.19. Uh, that is a big move. Although I will say this, uh, this up here, uh, uh, this move that we had setting these highs on the yields uh, for the cycle, I think that was overdone. So, you know, when we're looking at going from 498 to 391 as a big move. I think the move to 498 was overdone to begin with. That was that was in ridiculous territory at that time. Uh, I was buying uh, uh, bonds uh, at the 2048 maturities. Uh, I think I was getting 5.4, 5.5. I think I even got a 5.6 one morning when it was a real dump down and it recovered. Um, but I was buying... Uh, uh, at that point thinking, who, who would not be buying this? If you go back and listen to the uh, market outlooks at that time, I was saying, who who wouldn't be buying this right now? You'd be a fool not to. So I think that that was overdone. So I don't know that we could look at the 107 points and say, wow, that's a big rally, only because I think the 498 was overdone to begin with. But still, you can't doubt that in one week, uh, these are some big moves. Money market rates all well behaved. The one year starting to price in some cuts here. 4.95 uh, on the one year. 5.33 on the effective federal funds rate. 5.5 on the upper bound. Looks like it's pricing in two cuts. 
in, into the uh, one year, whereas the two year uh, is pricing in four, uh, four cuts at 4.44 yield here. Uh, we'll get better idea of what cuts are priced in by looking at the futures. Inversion will continue on the three month to the 10 year because the Fed is not cutting rates. The three month will reflect monetary policy whereas the 10-year will reflect uh, real GDP, prospects for real GDP and inflation expectations. Uh, so if there are rate cuts expected, um, mostly because inflation is coming down, that will come out of the curve or come out of the yield. The 10-year yield as it drops will only create a larger inversion because the three-year will be anchored by monetary, uh, sorry, the three-month will be firmly anchored by monetary policy. The 2 to the 10, the 2 does begin to price in uh, cuts in advance of the Fed moving. It tends to do that uh, ahead of time. Uh, same with the 10 year. So uh, you'll get either slight inversion, slight uh, increase in slope, but nothing really much changing. It'll probably hold very close to where it is now. So negative 53. We look at the beginning of the year. It was inverted by 53 basis points. It's still inverted by 53 basis points, 522 days now, 409 on the three month to 10 year. Balance sheet runoff continues and Powell said it will continue until uh, their reserves are slightly above what they consider ample. And he's saying bank reserves are sitting about three and a half trillion now and they're going to continue run, running off. So we know that three and a half trillion is not slightly above ample, otherwise they would stop. Didn't give a number for what that is. So uh, that'll require me uh, going to their balance sheet and looking uh, and trying to figure out if I can, you know, after staring at it for a while and doing some numbers, see if I can't figure out what that level would be. Um, runoff three point, almost 3.2 billion, down to 7.145 trillion. A balance sheet itself actually increased uh, by two billion. So, with a runoff here and an increase here, there was a net increase of 5.36 billion outside of what the SOMA has. Money market funds decreased. Uh, if I saw an increase here again, I'd say, "Oh, come on! What's going on?" It decreased by 11.55 billion. Uh, retail uh, still increasing here, 2.92. Government up 651 million, Prime up 3.45 billion. Institution is where you get the big drop down, 14.47 billion. Uh, government down 12.01, Prime down 2.07. Uh, so I see this like I did last week, and I say I should see a drop in the reverse repo. Last week I didn't, which caused me to say, well, what, what's going on there? It just, it just is, it's not that it's odd, it's just that it's just a bit inconsistent. This it would be consistent with a drop in uh, reverse repo, which, by the way, when I show it to you, wow, did it drop. Okay, never too early to be looking ahead. January 31st, FOMC is in 45 days. We get the minutes in 17 days, but if history is any guide, there'll be a lot of Fed speak before we get the minutes, thereby making the minutes pretty much well-known at that point so I don't know that there's much surprise when we get the minutes now Powell said that there was a discussion uh, about when to cut rates that they were aware of the risk of holding rates too high uh, for too long they were aware of that William said we didn't discuss it let's see if it shows up in the in the minutes uh, PCE for the US you get in five days <clears throat> a little bit earlier uh, only because the end of the month is complicated by Christmas and New Year's. Um, it's a big day Friday. Uh, you're getting PCE and you're getting durable goods and you're getting uh, Michigan consumer sentiment. Uh, in Canada, CPI is in two days and Canada November GDP, which is our preliminary look at November, uh, we get in five days. And keep in mind our third quarter GDP was negative. So threatening a recession there. Bank of Japan rate decision uh, one day. Uh, you get that tomorrow night. Uh, and uh, the yen has gone from 150, 151 to about 142. For those that had the applied level in the construction, uh, portfolio construction and management, we did a carry trade with the yen. 
where we borrowed in yen, uh, one million U.S. dollars. We borrowed in yen, which was 147 million yen, and we invested in the best money market security we could find in a paper account, which was uh, an, uh, an ETF, which you normally wouldn't do. But the concern was the currency. With a carry trade, the currency is always your biggest, your biggest risk concern. Uh, because if that moves against you, it can wipe out your trade very, very quickly. And with the yen at near 150, it was, you know, like standing in front of a steamroller. Uh, if you didn't move quick enough, you were going to get flattened. So uh, I had a discussion about that. And uh, for those of you that can recall, I said, right, let's just go ahead and close it. We've had a good run because we are flirting with disaster here. And sure enough, look where the yen is now, 142. Had we uh, not closed that position and kept it, uh, we would be uh, not wiped out, but a, a big hit uh, to, our, to our account would have occurred. Uh, as opposed to a big game. Uh, so we're good there. But the yen has been a funding currency for a long period of time because of its interest rate. So it has a very low appealing interest rate, but it has high currency risk. And I think that currency risk is even higher now. Uh, the yen probably with the interest rate move or any signal on an interest rate move probably on its own doesn't have, I think, uh, the strength to carry the yen to 135, 130, 125, but a threat of something happening uh, and any yen strength, if there's anything in that carry trade, that could cause a run on the yen, uh, an increase in the value of the yen just with the, let me out of this carry trade now before it gets too bad. So the stronger the yen gets, uh, the more likely uh, more hands are going to fold and get out of that carry trade. To get out, you got to buy the yen. You got to sell the currency that you're invested in and you got to buy the yen. So you've got a big risk event for a lot of carry trades tomorrow uh, with the uh, Bank of Japan rate decision here in the U.S. Wednesday 20-year bond auction, which eh, the 20 years not, uh, not, not a big not a big one. The 10-year and the 30 have more impact, but keep in mind you got a 20. Uh, and Thursday, a five year tips option. And we'll see real yield shortly, well under 2%, uh, which, you know, I can see nominal rates coming down and the Fed uh, sitting back saying, okay, but with real rates coming down, monetary policy is easing. If real rates stayed at 2% and nominal rates came down because inflation expectations were coming down, I think the Fed would be more likely to say, let it go and not push back against it. But if we're uh, thinking about Fed speak and pushing back against rate cuts, like pushing back against the market just so that their job doesn't get more difficult, it's the real rates that we would have to look at. And as real rates start dropping, that's where I think the Fed will be, uh, or all the Fed speakers will say, listen, let's get on the same page here. Let's push back on this because it's only going to make things worse for everybody, right? So uh, there is some risk in the open mouth operations. Never mind the open market, you know, Fed speak, we call that open mouth operations. Uh, so uh, the five-year tips, let's keep our eye on that one there. Uh, here are the probabilities going into January. Uh, no move. 90% probability. I think that's basically 100%. I think January is too soon to move. However, you know, stuff can happen. So let's keep some probability there. At least the market might be thinking that. 10% of a 25 basis point cut. 4% uh, last week. Now it's 10%. Uh, so it's actually increased. Uh, no move was 93.2%. They don't add to 100% because there was a 575 in there. This is zero is at 550. There was a plus 25, some small weight on a um, uh, plus 0.25. Going out to June, the weights have really changed here. So I've changed it here. Instead of at least one rate cut, I've got, got the probability set that at least two rate cuts or more. Last week uh, was 63.4% uh, of at least two rate cuts or more. Now it's 91.3% that by the June meeting, we will have seen at least two rate cuts, if not more. 
uh, and uh, only one rate cut or no rate cut sitting at 8.7% versus 36.6. That is a big shift uh, in futures being priced in the futures. 91.3% probability of at least, this is because that's a five, and we're at five, five now, at least two rate cuts, if not more, three rate cuts. Uh, almost 50% is, is sitting at three rate cuts by June. Three by June. That means that after January, you got to move one, two, three. I think that's a little soon. I think that's a little soon. Uh, New York Fed gives us the effective federal funds rate at 5.33. The 12-month uh, lag is 4.33. We're down to a 100 basis point lag. If we accept a 12-month on average lag, 100 basis points is still to be felt. Reverse repo, 821 on December 8th, 683, down 138 billion. That's at 5.3% because uh, you are getting, if you look at your money market rates, you're getting 5.33 all the way up to the six month. The six month pays 5.33, but not the one year. Uh, and there's a, a lot of supply now at the one month, the two month, the three month, the four month, all greater than 5.3, all greater than 5.3. Uh, percent uh, so reverse repo is dropping uh, as this starts getting close to the zero line you'll probably uh, hear more and more conversation about what does that mean in terms of liquidity uh, so a little too early for that conversation yet but uh, I think you'll start to hear more about the reverse repo we heard a lot about the reverse repo when it was 2.4 2.5 trillion Look at all that money in the reverse repo. Uh, and then we heard nothing about it for a very long period of time. I think 2.5 down to 683, that's absolutely amazing, isn't it? Uh, and, and really, uh, that is since the debt ceiling debacle. Now, that's really just since then that it's come down from the over 2 trillion mark. This thing has just dropped uh, like a drunk sailor drinking a beer, just uh, going down. Um, I would expect that as you start getting closer and closer to zero each week, it will become a bigger and bigger part of the conversation out there of what does it mean? What does it mean? And some people will say it means a lot. Other people will say it means nothing. But we really won't uh, get a good idea of what it means until uh, we start getting closer uh, to there and get better information. It will be interesting in the minutes because the minutes do talk about the reverse repo. It'll be interesting in the minutes to see what their thoughts about the reverse repo are uh, and whether or not anyone has raised concern about the reverse repo. Uh, so there's something to look forward to in the minutes. Okay, real yields. Look at those big cuts. And I think this is really uh, where uh, we need to pay attention. Nominal yields are exciting because we buy bonds. Nominal yields drop. Prices go up. We're very, very happy about that. But the pushback against the market from the Fed will come from the real yields. If real yields uh, stayed around 2% because they feel they are in sufficiently tight territory. No need to raise rates. We are in sufficiently tight territory. It's the real yield that matters, not the nominal yield. Uh, so this, this raises the risk of all of the Fed speak pushing back against the market. Uh, so this is where I would be a little concerned that uh, the nice rally we saw in yields has a threat ahead, being uh, that um, real yields are, are now well below 2%. Uh, for the most part, 175 basis points or lower. That was a big cut in one week, so if this continues, yeah, I think there'll be some pushback, especially from Williams, because Williams is the one that brought up uh, the idea of the Fed cutting uh, just to keep a just to target a real yield, so that real yields don't get too uh, uh, constrictive. So he thought, as inflation came down, he was thinking more in the lines of nominal yields. If nominal yields don't change as inflation comes down, the real yield will only get more restrictive. So we may have to cut rates just so that it doesn't get more restrictive. Well, it's getting easier. They haven't even cut rates. And he says, we're not even talking about it. That's not what Powell says. Somebody ought to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, psst, your buddy already blew the cover on that. Uh, but this, it'll be interesting to see what he says about this because this is going in the wrong direction. 
uh, from, I think, what their plan was. Uh, so if there is risk to the TLT trade, if there is risk to the uh, bond trade, to the duration trade, it's going to come from real yields relaxing too quickly. And the Fed saying, okay, we gotta, we got to push back against it. Not with higher rates, uh, but with a little finger wagging and, uh, brow, and brow beating. we got to, you know, pull another Jackson Hole on the market. Uh, look at the Fed funds futures. Uh, you're going to see no change uh, for January. Nobody's expecting any change. You know, the implied rate here, 5.335. Implied rate, 5.33. Uh, that's, that's just positioning. There's nothing there. Uh, going to the end of June... Uh, the implied rate 4.79 from 4.94 last week, another 15 and a half basis points. So between the end of January uh, and the end of June, because the futures are priced for the end of the month, even though the meeting is on the 12th, it's priced for the end of the month, 51 basis point, basically two rate cuts uh, somewhere between uh, June, uh, the end of January and the end of June, two rate cuts. Going out to the end of September, implied rate of 4.4%, which is another 38.5 points down from the end of June. So that belongs to Q3. This belongs to Q1 and Q2. Uh, 24 basis points week over week on the implied rate. December 20, 2024, sorry, December 2024 over December 2023, 3.88 on one month so far versus 5.3547 basis points. That's six cuts the uh, scp looks like it has three in there this has six leave it to the market to just you know give it an inch it'll take a mile right you got to snap them back into uh into line q2 negative 51 is uh, uh with a 51 basis point drop is firmly suggesting two rate cuts q3 38 and a half is somewhere one one and a half i put between one and two cuts there q4 if we uh, take this off of the 147, we have 57 and a half points we have to account for. There's two rate cuts there. So two, two, and then one to two, you're five to six. I just round it up and say there's your six cuts because you're 147 uh, basis points. Getting closer to, um, I think it was UBS uh, that uh, had 10, 10 rate cuts. Now we're at six TLT. No surprise here, had a wonderfully beautiful week, up 4.88%. Here's a chart I haven't been able to show you in a long time because it never got to that price. Look at that green line. That is my <laughs> average price on TLT. Notice that it's green above here, right? And look where I am. I'm up here. I'm, I'm in the money on TLT now on my uh, remaining TLT position. Uh, but previous to that, uh, we didn't have a price that went that high on the chart. So look at that. You know, welcome home. Uh, there we are. I uh, did sell the $100 calls on this one. I sold the $100 calls because my concern is that we've gone uh, a lot. We're actually lower uh, uh, or even or lower on the long end of the curve than at the beginning of the year. Uh, and real rates are becoming a bit of a problem. Had we stuck close to the 200 basis points on real rates, I might have looked at this and said, mm, well, let's just, let's just let it go for a bit. Uh, but I sold $100 calls, uh, which is above my, my break even. I did it on, on uh, late in the week, so I got, uh, I got a good price. And I was going to do it Thursday, and I thought, nice. let's just wait another day uh, and, and see what happens. Uh, or was it Friday? Thursday or Friday? I forget which day I did it now, but I sold hundreds at a fairly good price. So if they're called away from me, uh, I'm not too concerned. Implied volatility dropping a bit, 13 week down to 26% from 32. So premiums coming out of the uh, coming out of the options. And there it is. There I sold the January 1900 calls. If they are called away from me, uh, it unties some money. I will move it to MBS. Um, November, uh, the, um, when um, rates were really high, yields were high, uh, I, I was buying uh, the November 48 bonds. I, I bought some strips. My average cost basis on these strips was $27.59. Uh, they closed at $35.97. Uh, less than two months, a 30, almost a 31% increase in price in less than two months. 
Uh, and uh, my, uh, I told you about six weeks ago I bought REITs uh, because I was sitting in cash. I had sold all my REITs at the beginning, near the beginning of the year, mid part of the year, end of the first quarter. I got out of REITs, I think first quarter, somewhere in the beginning of second quarter, I can't remember, but I got all out of REITs. Uh, and with the uh, peak in yields, uh, the Canadian apartment REITs were selling at such a low price uh, for a market that has a, a massive shortage of housing. So I bought cap REIT, I think at 4080. I bought Interrent, I think it was uh, 1156. And I bought Killam, which is an East Coast uh, apartment REIT at 1565. Uh, I did close this one and this one and this one on Friday. I spent 400k uh, for these, and I think my uh, net was 510 uh, on closing these out. 110 uh, in six weeks on apartment buildings, 30% uh, in eight weeks on bonds. This is a messed up market that we're in when these things start behaving like tech stocks. It's just incredible. It's been a really brutal year to figure things out, but I'll tell you something. Uh, the uh, duration benefit that I got in the last eight weeks uh, wipes out that beta loss that I had earlier in the year. So I will end the year owing the Canadian government a significant amount of money. <laughs> Notice I don't say that I made a lot this year. The Canadian government made a lot this year on my skill and expertise. Um, this is the, these are all in uh, registered accounts. This was in my TFSA and my RSP, which uh, is long only positions, no leverage, long only positions, no derivatives. So it's 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 much more difficult uh, to get to, to get big gains in there unless you get lucky. I got lucky, uh, so I took the gain, and I'll move that into uh, into bonds because Canadian bonds still have a, a good yield, and Bank of Canada's got to cut. They're gonna cut. Even though Tiff Macklem is saying we're not we're not even there yet, and we may raise one more time, he's not gonna. He he he's not gonna. He just doesn't want the market to move uh, without him making the decision, right? A bit of a control freak there, but he's gonna cut. He's 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 gonna he's gonna have to. Uh, and this is I think one central banker that doesn't have very very many good options. Uh, can't can't raise can't raise. Uh, probably can't stay where you are. The, the next logical move for Bank of Canada, I think, and I don't know when, but the next logical move would be a rate cut, in which case bonds are the big winner uh, at that point. So I'll take that nice fast gain in six weeks, I think six, seven weeks, I'll take that nice fast gain and I'll move it into Canadian bonds. Uh, and if my TLT gets called away, uh, I will move it into MBS. However, given what's going on here, and given uh, the natural amount of Fed speak you have after uh, after a meeting, um, it wouldn't surprise me if there is much more pushback against the market pricing in six rate cuts. And I think that it wouldn't be unreasonable to see a pullback in TLT. Uh, maybe uh, back to it had trouble over here. You know, it kind of was peaking out here at about 90, 95, 95 and a half. It wouldn't. It probably would be healthy to see it retrace and retest that level for a while before uh, finding finding its way up. So, I feel I feel good about selling the calls. Uh, if they're not called away, great. I'm I'm back in the business of, of selling calls or, and selling puts on TLT. Uh, if they are called away, great opportunity to head over to MBS. Okay, some big moves when it comes over to housing. We have a uh, fixed rate mortgage under 7%, now 6.95. If it um, goes back to its historical spread over the next couple of weeks or next month or two, you should see that below 6%, a five handle on that 30 year. Uh, contracted by eight basis points, 10 year contracted by 22. So the spread actually increased by 14 to 303 basis points. The typical spread is somewhere between 175 and 200. This is 303. Uh, so if the risk in there disappears and the spread uh, goes back to uh, its, well, I'll call it a mean reverting level because it has been, uh, you could be under a five, sorry, an under a 6% fixed rate 
five point something. If uh, I think if you're going for a mortgage now, I certainly wouldn't get a 30 year fixed. I'd probably get a short term floating rate because over the next year, uh, your interest rate will only drop. Uh, go floating rate for a couple of years and and then go into uh, then go into a, a fixed rate. Uh, if you take the 15 year fixed rate, you're at six point uh, six point three eight. Mortgage applications uh, ending December 8th. Look at that. Up 7.4%. Now that we're under 7%, next Wednesday morning, Wednesday at 7 a.m., we get the uh, the mortgage apps. Uh, every week we get it. Uh, this is, I think, eight or nine weeks in a row that mortgage applications have been positive. Uh, and being under 7%, if it stays this way or even drops even more by next Wednesday, uh, you could see another, another jump. Uh, up in uh, mortgage applications. The housing stocks really liked it. Look at this DHI up 8.41, Lennar up 7. Now they were up more on Thursday. They gave back on Friday because Lennar, and I, I went through their, their statements, I went through their past margins, and I listened to their conference call. Um, they, uh, uh, the story is that Lennar is dropping even though they beat on revenues and had good guidance they did it at the cost of their margins not much it, it wasn't a lot and their uh, guidance was that they expect that to continue into Q1 uh, with margins repairing after that uh, that they're just doing it uh, uh, that it's you know a short-term period and they expect their margins to recover after that so it seemed a little a little overdone uh, 8.41, 6.95, Pulte, 6.4, KB Homes, 7, Toll Brothers, 10, Havnanian, 7.2. But this this belies something here. If you go back to, I think it was November 28th, uh, they closed at $87. Uh, and in pre-market on Friday, uh, they were pushing almost 170 They were at about 167 168 uh, in pre-market. Um, now, when you think about this, this is almost 100%, 100% rise in 17 days, 100%. This is a housing stock. It's not a biotech stock. It's not a software company. It's a housing stock, 100%. It's a function of its small float. It has a very small float. So it is super, super volatile. Uh, and here's the deal on this one, insiders are selling like they've never sold before. Lots of insider sales on this one. I shouldn't say like never before because I've never really looked at their history. But compared to what you'd expect insider sales typically to be, insiders are selling. Uh, this reminds me of Beyond Meat. When Beyond Meat was uh, 150, 160, it was insider sales, insider sales, insider sales, always insider sales, no buying. And you're seeing this now because I think they're recognizing that, hey, this small float, and this sentiment has given us a huge payday. Have a look at a, a longer term chart of Hovnanian and look at where they are. I mean, I think they're, they're at, the, well, they're more than 52 week highs. I think two year highs, three year highs, four year highs. I think maybe even all time highs. Um, this thing is volatile. If you are looking for a day trading stock, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, this is it here. It has no options though, but you gotta be careful you can get crushed just as easily as you can, you know, you make 100%, you can lose 100% uh, on this thing. You can get wiped out quick, especially if you're using leverage on this one. So just be careful. But this thing is volatile. Wow. IYR up 5.59. PLD up 12. DLR having, uh, <clears throat> having some trouble here. I think Blackstone announced that uh, they are going to uh, do a joint venture with DLR on some data centers. I don't know if that's, if the deal just wasn't in DLR's favor, but more in Blackstone's favor. I didn't dig into it, but having trouble. Home, uh, the Home Builder ETF up 7.05. The Home Construction ETF up 7.98. And the, I heard a great uh, uh, analysis of this of where to sit whether you want to sit in home builders or home construction and home builders seem to be the one that you want to sit in uh, and the logic goes like this <clears throat> um, home construction also includes home improvement and with existing home sales being low 
uh, home improvement will be low because it's usually an increase in existing home sales that drives home improvement. You buy an existing home, you move into it, and you say, well, we don't like these things over here. Let's change the flooring, let's change the kitchen, and let's build a deck out the back with a pool. It, you're more likely to upgrade into a new home than your existing home. And being that existing home sales uh, are uh, under pressure and are so low, uh, but it's not affecting new home sales. New home construction is running at an annual run rate of about a million, which is, which is quite high. That if you focus more on the home builders, an ETF that tracks the home builders rather than home construction, you get rid of the home improvement part of it. But they are uh, highly correlated, highly correlated. Uh, but I, I listen and I thought, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Getting a more an ETF that's more of a pure play on home builders, XHB. What do we got for uh, home building uh, uh, data this week? The National Association of Home Builders uh, Housing Market Index previous was 34. This will be for December. Uh, that was low, but we've had uh, mortgage rates coming down during that period of time. Mortgage applications going up. Uh, I, I, and being that this is uh, somewhat sentiment driven, uh, let's let's see if this has an increase uh, from 34. If it does, you're going to get another repeat week over here. Building permits uh, for November out on Tuesday, along with housing starts. Wednesday, existing home sales, and if existing home sales are low, I kind of like that thesis. Uh, that the uh, ITB uh, would probably underperform the XHB there. And Friday, new home sales. And if that's up, then yeah, it continues to reinforce this thesis and another a bullish, uh, a bullish time for the home builders. The other big story this week, the big mover, was the U.S. dollar. I mean, the Canadian dollar really uh, was a beneficiary of that. I took the opportunity... Um, when I saw the 133 handle on the uh, Canadian to switch more Canadian uh, into U.S. And I've got a lot more to switch, but it's, it's, it's the speed at which I can get it into interactive brokers. The amount that I want to move is above my bank's limit and is above interactive brokers' limit, which means I actually have to physically be at the bank to get it done, and I'm in Costa Rica. So <laughs> I'm doing transfers every day in the limit that I have uh, to, to try to exchange it in my Canadian into U.S. while I have these rates. 133, a 133 handle. Uh, going back just two months ago, it was a 138 handle, 500, uh, uh, 500 pips. Uh, and when you're exchanging a significant amount, it ends up being a lot of money uh, just on the exchange rate, a lot more American that you're getting than you normally would. You just, you just end up making more just with the exchange rate movement. So I'm hoping it continues on. I'd like to see a 132, 132.5 on the Canadian dollar. Thank you, Tiff Macklem, by the way, for saying that maybe there's even more rate hikes in Canada. I think he's lying, but thank you for saying that because it does add strength to the Canadian when you have the Fed saying, uh, we see three rate cuts next year, and the Bank of Canada saying, we're not even talking about that. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about maybe even a rate hike Thank you for that because it serves my purpose. If the Canadian can gain more strength, uh, I make U.S. dollars just from the Canadian going up because I have to move into, into U.S. dollars and I still have Canadian dollars that I have to translate. Here's uh, a, uh, going back to 1968 here, uh, <clears throat> the U.S. dollar. And we can see uh, in a long-term chart a series of higher uh, uh, sorry, lower highs and a series of lower lows uh, in a long-term perspective. Last 20 years sort of tells a, a different story. You had a trading range for a period of time and then it jumped to another uh, trading range and it is dropping on this end, but it's probably going to hit uh, some resistance near its last low, which was just a little under 100, sitting at 102.58. I'm not big on technical analysis, but currencies lack a balance sheet <clears throat> and uh, often lack um, good uh, a, a fundamental basis to evaluate other than a long-term uh, evaluation of purchasing power parity. In the short term, there's all sorts of things that can move uh, a currency, so it tends to trade uh, a lot more technically, so you do have to look at a chart. <clears throat> so as where it sits right now, 
uh, it wouldn't surprise me if if it went from 102 88 to 100 question is can it break 100 and uh, head to the lower part of that previous range uh, which is uh, under 89 I'm oh, sorry I'm not under 89 under 90 that would be a huge move on the currency uh, if you have the Fed uh, uh, speakers push back against the drop in real rates, it will support the uh, U.S. dollar. Uh, getting below 100 on the DXY would be challenging. However, if there is no pushback uh, at all, this sort of suggests that they're comfortable with it. If there is no pushback, you could break the 100. Do you make it all the way to 90? I don't think you make it to 90 until they actually start cutting rates. So I don't know that I would look to a, a run to 90, but a run to 100 <clears throat> would not be unreasonable at this point. Again, unless the Fed comes out and really starts pushing back on those real rates and gives the dollar some grounding. If we uh, move in a little bit more, uh, there is a 10-year. It sort of takes out the previous, uh, the previous range. You can see where we are here at the low, uh, the last point uh, in July of 2023. Just, just call it 100, 99.96, call it 100, we're at 102.58. So yeah, I think, I think the momentum could continue unless somebody pushes back against it. No pushback, um, then you could start setting up a, a sustained move below 100, closes below 100. To see uh, the recent move in uh, more recent perspective here, uh, here is, uh, we, we are, what 10688 to peak 107 all the way down to 10258 look at this big drop uh, during this last week uh, with the fed meeting and a small rebound on williams statement friday so that's what it can do uh, a fed official coming out and pushing back can give some support uh, to the uh, to the dollar uh, i would say uh, you're probably the 100 level on the dxy is probably in play um maybe a hundred, you know, if, if you think, well, it could go higher, it could go lower, I would seem to think a hundred before, before you start seeing 105, 100 before 105. Uh, but the, if you have any trade that is dependent on either a stronger or weaker dollar, um, this is something to look at. A weaker dollar does uh, support commodity prices though. Uh, a stronger dollar uh, uh, supports uh, or works as sort of a headwind against higher commodity prices, but the weaker the dollar, uh, the higher commodity prices would go. Gold, silver probably being the primary beneficiaries of that. The other precious metals, platinum uh, and palladium, would probably be the beneficiaries of that. Okay, S&P, forward, four quarter operating earnings, IBES 235.77, that is a drop. And uh, 233.66 from SB Global. It is unchanged. I thought uh, I didn't download the updated spreadsheet. I checked the dates. No, I did. It's just tch, curiously unchanged. That sets up a 20.1 forward multiple because you did have a 2.5% increase in the S&P over the last week uh, with almost, call it unchanged or even a slight drop in earnings with a 2.5% increase on the price. 20.1 versus 19.6 last week. Uh, and the S&P printed another 52-week high last week, 472. A closing price of 472 is another 52-week high, closed at 470.10. This 470.10 is 1.54% below an all-time high. NASDAQ, all-time high. Dow, all-time high. Don't, don't continue on I want you to stop and reflect on what I just said uh, for a moment all time highs right here right now at five and a half percent the Dow and the Nasdaq are at all time highs the S&P is 1.5 percent below its all time high all at a multiple that is over 20 times uh, forward earnings with inflation that is dropping, meaning that interest rates may drop. We, we forget that first conditional, interest rates, I mean, inflation that is dropping. That's a big deal, because if you look at the forecast for growth next year, it's really low. 
Uh, but the economy has uh, has has made fools of every forecaster uh, all through 2023. I being one of them. I didn't think that beta would perform as well as it did, and man, was I wrong. I wasn't. I wasn't wrong. I was really wrong. And then I decided to give up right at the worst point. <laughs> mistake on the way in. Mistake on the way out. Oh well, that proves that I'm human. I'm fallible. I make mistakes. Um, so let's think about the first statement, inflation coming down. Because if inflation doesn't come down, interest rates are not coming down. If inflation comes down, interest rates are coming down. Yay, the denominator, interest rates, right? Uh, but inflation is the numerator. Inflation is if companies are not raising prices, well, then you don't get inflation. If you don't have inflation, it means companies aren't raising prices. They are the same thing. And if you look at, uh, at a lot of the earnings uh, in this past quarter, uh, a lot of it was made up, uh, the difference in earnings year over year, the biggest part of it was made up in price realization, not volume. In fact, for many companies, volume uh, took away from earnings and price realization out of it. So usually they give you a chart like this in the investor presentation. There's last year's earnings, and they'll have a number of categories. One is volume, one is price, one is costs, one is a currency exchange, and they'll get to this year's earnings. And then they give you little bars like this, you know, that show you how they, how they stepped up uh, uh, to get to this level here. And the volume, you know, will be a drop. Price realization is an increase. That was the most common, uh, common pattern. Uh, or if there was volume that contributed, it was very, very light with price realization being the big one. Okay, let's uh, say inflation is coming down. Uh, you're not going to get that next year. You're not going to get uh, uh, to make your earnings on price realization, which means you have to do it on volume, but volume was light. Uh, if volumes don't pick up into next year and you're not going to get price realization because inflation is going away, that's how you're getting interest rate cuts if inflation goes away, uh, earnings could be setting up to disappoint. Because remember, inflation is your revenue. Price times quantity, right? So if quantity throughout 2023 has been low, but, uh, you know, you have inflation that was running 35 4 4.5% throughout the year, well, 45 coming down to 35 and if we expect the 35 to keep coming down, if this does not recover, what's going on with revenues? What's going on with this chart? This chart here would go away. And that means that earnings would show very uh, small growth year over year. And if that is the case, isn't that a little high uh, for a low uh, uh, earnings growth environment? Um, but listen, this market has defied uh, logic uh, all year long. So, uh, you know, does it does it come back into logic where we say, okay, well, it couldn't, it couldn't be illogical that long. We all couldn't be that wrong for that long. You could be wrong for a period of time because the market can do some, some odd things in the short run, but uh, rationality does come back in the long run. That's what I would be concerned about. If we're celebrating uh, rate cuts with higher equity prices, those rate cuts are going to come, not because the economy is weak, because it clearly isn't, but because inflation is going away. And if inflation is going away, pricing power is going away, right? Because if you don't have price increases, you don't have inflation. Say it backwards. If I don't have inflation, I don't have price increases. And if price realization was making my earnings in 2023, what's it going to do in 2024? I need quantity. I need quantity, right? Another argument against that is, well, listen, uh, consumers in America spend every penny they make, 80% spend every penny they make. Uh, it, the uh, stuff they walk home with is a function of price. If the price is lower, they'll just go home with more stuff. So there's your volume. Okay. You know, that sets up an interesting play into next year is, will the consumer continue to spend every penny they make as prices drop? Uh, and they'll just, and we'll see volume because they'll just be able to buy more of the stuff. And next year, it'll be the other way around where volume is very high and price realization may take a little bit away or add nothing. Will we see that? Or are volumes as high as they can be right now? 
uh, and uh, price realization, if you're not getting it, will just take away from the growth. I don't know. I don't know yet, but there is the, I think there is the knife's edge that you have to, uh, that you have to walk along and accept a 20, uh, 20 time forward multiple. Uh, implied volatility disappearing as well. Uh, no fear, no put buying, just disappearing. This week for earnings, we do have some. Accenture on Tuesday, FedEx Tuesday after the close, General Mills on Wednesday, CarMax on Thursday, Nike Thursday after the close. And that's it. I think, I think the uh, discussion of the Fed can probably move from the driver's seat. We're still in the car, right? Here's the front seat, here's the driver's seat, passenger seat, and then you have the back seat. And the Fed has been driving the car for a while. I think we move the Fed over in the front seat, still a passenger in the front seat because they can still reach over and yank the steering wheel one way or the other. But I think we move uh, earnings and growth uh, into the driver's seat. And I think that for equities right now, that's the thing is earnings and growth. And I think the Fed, being that they're on pause now and being that inflation is coming down, we can move them over. We're not ready to stick them in the back seat. Uh, but certainly not the driver anymore, but, but they're in the driver's, uh, you know, the driver's front seat, just not driving. Mm, that's about the best analogy I can give for where I think they are right now. I think, uh, you know, coming into Q1, once we get into January, uh, second to third week, and we start seeing earnings, I think they'll take more of center stage, especially the guidance uh, uh, for 2024, uh, and uh, we'll place that there. And that's it for the week. Um, some of you uh, had asked to see some pictures of the house, so uh, I'll show you some pictures I took uh, yesterday. And, uh, uh, you know, there'll be more uh, when I do a video about my whole move down here. Okay, a couple of pictures of just the uh, exterior of the house. That's the back of the house, uh, and that is at one end of the house. It's a long pool. It's 51 feet long or 52 feet long. Uh, and then you have an outdoor barbecue area and a little uh, gas fireplace thing over there. I'll give you a close-up shot. But there's one view. There is the driveway up. There is a, uh, a gate. Uh, the gate slides open and you drive up. And this is the view you see uh, when you drive up to the house. Uh, here is, this is just natural gas. It, uh, you could sit here at night and nice little warm fire. It, gets, it, it can get down to 15, 16 degrees at night. And there is the view of the mountain range. Uh, this is a jacuzzi uh, area here, uh, and if you walk and stand right here, uh, sorry, uh, that is the picture down. This is a stables. There are seven stables under here, and this is sort of a grassy area on top of the stables. You can see the the training track down here, and down there is where the horses hang out. And I think, I don't know if you can see it, but we'll zoom in a little bit here, and we should be able to see a horse right there i don't know if you can see that but there's a horse uh right there uh and then looking back at the house uh there you go uh, just a few pictures of uh of what that looks like so that's where i am uh, i will be doing a video about the whole process of why i left canada the difference in the taxes uh, I say there's no income tax down here, and there isn't, but that does not mean there's no tax. There are taxes. You do pay just in different places, uh, and I'll tell you about uh, what was good and what was bad about the whole process. And that's it for this week.